I think the Chinese government generally takes a, what I call a techno-utilitarian approach to technology, which is uh, believing that advancement of technology will actually take priority over many other issues by experiment, by letting technologies launch early and then um, figuring out if they need to be regulated later. Hello, you're listening to the first episode of the second season of the Exponential View podcast. My name is Azim Azar. I'm the host of the podcast. I write the newsletter of the same name. If you haven't listened to the introductory episode, episode zero, I suggest you do. It'll give you a good introduction to the theme of the season. In short, over the next several weeks, I'll be talking to world experts on a range of topics relevant to the brave new world emerging at the intersection of the global political economy and technology. The voice you heard at the start of the podcast is that of my first guest, Dr. Kai-Fu Lee. Now a venture capitalist based in China, he once developed the most advanced speech recognition systems in the world for Apple Computer and went on to hold senior roles at Google and Microsoft. Kai-Fu is one of the most prominent figures in the Chinese internet sector and certainly one of the most knowledgeable of the state of China's AI development. He has a noticeable following on the interwebs with more than 50 million followers on social media. His new book, AI Superpowers, China, Silicon Valley and the New World Order, is all fact, but it sometimes feels like it's part sci-fi, part international thriller and part biography wonderful book, fantastic man, great conversation. For the next few weeks, the Exponential View podcast is sponsored by Spotify. I'm a massive fan of Spotify, and they've now added another killer feature, a podcast hub where you can get your favourite shows, including this one. So next time you launch Spotify, search for Exponential View and pick up the next episode there. Hi, Fu. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, thank you. It's great to be here. And just tell me, where are you based? Uh, where are you today? Uh, are you in Beijing or are you in Shanghai or somewhere else? I'm in Beijing today. I'm mostly in Beijing. That's where I had headquarters based. Beijing and China in general forms a, a fundamental part of, uh, of your new book. Um, and it really does seem like uh, it's all stations go um, over there right now. Um, tell me a, a little bit about how you found, you're finding the current approach towards uh, AI uh, amongst the, the entrepreneurial community in China. Uh, right. Uh, I think China is um, very advanced in its internet applications. So over the past 10 years, China has very quickly evolved from what some people point out as a more of a copycat into original innovators of uh, new applications. And with these applications come a large amount of data and the amount of data from China compared to, say, U.S. is not just three times, but as much as 50 times in specific domains, because there's massive amount of usage and even some very advanced uses, such as uh, popularized mobile payment that has replaced uh, the cash and credit card in the society. And these kind of huge amount of data just creates opportunities for using AI to better monetize and reduce the costs. So that kind of is the first uh, push for the huge amount of data in the internet space in China. But going beyond that, uh, AI is a very popular uh, area of study for the Chinese engineers, and even more so in the more recent years. So there's a flood of engineers coming into AI, large number of entrepreneurs. Uh, China has uh, very rapidly uh, developed uh, some of the world's uh, leading companies in speech recognition, uh, com uh, machine translation, um, computer vision, drones. So in almost all mm -hmm. key areas of AI, China just quickly rose up because, because I think deep learning became that uh, very important technology that was released to the world uh, around uh, eight or 10 years ago. And China has quickly grasped it, learned it, applied it to internet, and now moved on to perceptual domains with huge amount of data that's pushing it forward. So those are the primary reasons that explain China's recent rise in AI. 
there are two or three really interesting uh, dimensions uh, that you, you raised there. One was the, the scale of usage and the scale of data. The, the second was the application of this technology, the deep learning. Um, and the, the third was the, uh, the sort of vigor with which the, the, the entrepreneurs have gone after this, the, the market. Let's just look at that first question. You said that there's many orders of magnitude, more data. Um, I, I read that China just passed 800 million um, internet users. Uh, in the in the past few weeks, which is obviously makes it far and away the largest market by by number of of users. Um, but why why do you think the uh, amount of data that's available that's being generated is so much higher uh, per user than it is in some other markets? Because I think you you implied that in the your last statement. Right, right. Uh, I think the use of um, mobile technology, mobile internet, has broadened much deeper in China than. In the U.S., there are a couple of factors. One is there's a giant super app called WeChat, which is really a combination of so many things and so easy to use. It's kind of a combination of a better than Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp product for communications. It's got a payment system built in. You can pay anybody any amount of money. You can use it to buy online goods, but also use it to buy offline goods as well as services. So, so this single super app allows you to hail uh, Uber-like service, allows you to order takeout from a thousand restaurants. So the entire Chinese life has become digitally injected uh, in such a way that's not imaginable in the U.S. or Europe. For example, when I go home every day, I can just um, uh, use my, uh, my WeChat or one of the other apps and order takeout from a thousand restaurants and they'll deliver to my home uh, basically free of charge and the food is still hot, cooked 20, 30 minutes. There's an entire delivery network. So as a result, food delivery is more than 10 times the volume of other countries. And then uh, people have uh, developed, expanded beyond the Uber into shared bicycles. So there are uh, 50 million rides um, uh, per day in China in shared bicycle. And that creates data about locations and people and spending. And then the biggest one of them all is mobile payment. If you come to China now, you'll find it um, actually quite inconvenient for foreigners because most Chinese people and stores, most stores don't prefer not to accept cash. And uh, they prefer not to take credit cards now because mobile payment is just taken over. Imagine 800 million people, uh, anyone can pay anyone with no commission, almost no commission charged, um, and you can pay as little as 15 US cents. And that completely changes the way um, monetary currency flow works because people are giving each other uh, allowances, they can go Dutch very easily, uh, they owe money, they can borrow money from, from WeChat and, and, and Alipay, and they buy everything on it. And the entire volume of uh, uh, mobile payment transaction exceeded China's GDP, reaching about 17 trillion US dollars. So all of this is uh, rocket fuel to the artificial intelligence engine, because imagine what Tencent can do to mine the data uh, in terms of uh, spending and uh, and people who use it for all kinds of apps. Imagine also what a store owner could do, because now you know who came and bought what every day, as opposed to just uh, collecting the cash and uh, doing the inventory at the end of the day. So suddenly there is uh, data, intelligence, and AI being buildable into traditional and um, internet applications. So that's where all the data is coming from. It's a larger population plus a rapidly digitizing world with the uh, world's data being injected into this uh, uh, AI engine in all the companies. Yeah, it, it's fascinating that you, you talk about how the data could get integrated there. I had a great conversation with somebody from Ant Financial, which is the, as you know, the huge uh, payments uh, service uh, spun out of uh, Alibaba. And he showed me an example of um, they, they, they looked at the usage of um, uh, they looked at the data on the platform and they found out that 
women who bought skinny jeans were more likely to break their smartphones. Uh, and so they created a, an insurance package just for that micro segment. Uh, which was priced appropriately, marketed appropriately. Um, and it just struck me as a, such a clever example of advanced analytics that's only possible if you have an integrated view of, of lots of data. And, and of course, backed up by your ability to deliver a new product quite, quite rapidly. Um, and it seems to be a, just a, 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 if that's happening thousands of times a day across hundreds of different companies, the overall pace of innovation is going to look extremely fast. That's right. Um, I think traditionally, we almost all companies are run uh, by grouping users into large segments which don't fit individuals. You know, the media you, you used to be, uh, you know, large uh, ed editors putting away sections and then with different brands of media. Insurance companies would group people into different risk categories. Um, uh, but, but nowadays, uh, and also banks would create uh, products to sell to different groups of people. But now everything can be individualized once you have personal information that can be mapped against the overall user base. So there can be personalized investment vehicles, personalized um, insurance. And also um, actually another interesting example for China is a personalized uh, new, new news feed, a newspaper called um, ByteDance. I dance is a company mm -hmm. that delivers uh, news and content targeted for you and only for you. And everybody's look is completely different. And that's also using the AI engine. Yeah, that, that's, a, is it Tutao, the name of the service from ByteDance? Uh, yes, yes. ByteDance is the parent yeah. company. Totiao is the product. And the company yeah. is believed to be valued at about $50 billion after five years of uh, existence. I'm quite curious though about how um, what I see as a distinction between the way, um, say, American or European founders go after um, markets and building their companies and what I seem to see in uh, Chinese companies over the last 10 to 15 years, which is that uh, in, in the Western companies, there tends to be a belief in, you know, focusing and the purity of just doing one thing. So if you are LinkedIn, you just do business social networking and if you are groupon you just do groupon style coupons and and it, it seems to be steeped into the product management culture um you know focus on the one thing and when i look at some of the chinese companies that have grown to be very large very successful they seem to be um or how can i describe this very, very unrelenting in capturing as much territory as they can, even if it means stepping outside of the core of person-to-person -person messaging uh, or search. Um, is that a reasonable characterization of the, the distinction? And, and if it is, why do you think that um, that difference, that pattern emerges between uh, Chinese founders and, and Western founders? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I would, in my book, AI Superpowers, I talk about the going light versus going heavy approach. Uh, you know, Groupon is a very lightweight approach uh, to uh, getting discounts at uh, offline. You know, um, uh, Pinterest is a very lightweight approach. That's for people to share things. Instagram is very lightweight and so on. But the Chinese companies like the, the, the heavy approach. So uh, as an example, you know, Uber is a fairly lightweight uh, layer where uh, the, the, a lot of the self-organization happens with people who want to drive their car and, and, and uh, uh, give rides to other people. But the heavy version of that called uh, in China is DD, while DD also offers, off, offers uh, ride sharing, uh, they actually are going into uh, buying cars and leasing them out and uh, giving loans for buying cars, uh, insurance for drivers, and uh, gas stations, uh, as well as car repair. So if you think about why would you go into these heavy areas, because they're, you know, from an American's perspective, it seems like you're not so focused, maybe you can't run all of them very well, and also the, they're not as good business, not delivering as good margin, uh, but from, I think from a DD perspective, this is how you build barrier of entry. Because if you just win the right sharing competition, you have 80% share, someone has 20% share, 
you can never have declare complete victory. So in order to declare complete, complete victory, you want to really provide so many other benefits, such as you know lower cost loan, maybe you get a new car every four years, maybe the gas station is 10% off, or the car repair shop knows all about your car, and all these services connect together so that your, um, uh, your car repair records will come back to become your uh, driving record for the company so they can determine whether you're a good driver, five star or four stars. And also they can lock you in by saying, look, by agreeing uh, to be, to, to get by, by taking advantage of all the discounts and benefits we offer as a DD driver, um, you agree not to drive for another company. So, so essentially what the Chinese companies are doing is they're unafraid of tackling on, tack, uh, tacking on new, um, complementary businesses that can make money that may be very hard to build up, but once they build it up, it will create a very defensible moat that will allow them to keep their competitive positions. So these new businesses aren't added on haphazardly as just new ways to make money, but they co- they cohesively group together to become um, essentially extension of their empire, uh, makes it hard for competitors to enter, and gives them incremental uh, revenue and um, um, and also uh, symbiotic services for all the all the things that they provide. So it's a very clever business strategy. But what it requires is a CEO who has to be multi talented, hire a um, diverse group of managers, and have them work together in a single culture. So it's a much much more difficult job. But once you uh, accomplish it, you will have a more sustainable business with, uh, with um, um, th- more diff- that's more difficult to challenge for the competition and therefore more profitable. Uh, you describe this as gladiatorial combat uh, in, in your book, but I'm curious about this real relentless focus on total domination that comes across both in your book and, and your, your last um, answer. Is there some cultural or historical driver uh, you think that has has resulted in this being the sort of pattern of behavior um, uh, uh, amongst Chinese founders? Is it the the sort of recent brush with uh, sort of communism from 1949 uh, for the till the till the late 80s, early 90s? Is it something that is more deep seated in uh, Chinese values and culture? Uh, there's some deep, uh, deep cultural related elements. Uh, I, I think, um, a lot of the Chinese history is full of, uh, strategizing of how, what strategies allow which emperor to f- defeat the other emperor. For example, in the Ming dynasty, uh, the founding emperor, uh, has a very famous phrase that says, build high walls and, um, um, store a huge amount of grain and take your, bide your time before you declare yourself to be the king. So that I think is a kind of a motto for the Chinese entrepreneur, um, who are relentless, ambitious, uh, and even though they may win, a, uh, to become the winning gladiator in one small coliseum, they move on to the next one. So the winner of the O2O is now go moving on to do right sharing. And, and so on. So I think it's uh, uh, ambition, uh, desire to strategize, uh, think multi steps ahead. These are part of the Chinese business practices. And uh, winner take all uh, are some of the, the beliefs that may drive this. I think economically, uh, China really started to open up in the late 70s, about almost 40 years ago. And that was driven by something um, um, that Deng Xiaoping, who had the courage and the brilliance to say, which is, uh, despite uh, the China's previous system, it is time to let some people get rich first. And that created kind of a gold rush that people want, everyone wanted to be the first set of people who got rich first. And the, that, that then led to incredible work ethic um, a strong desire for success and um, wanting to be winner take all 
and extreme competitiveness. And if you didn't get to become the first group that got rich first, you want to be the second group or the third group. Don't want to be left out. And, and, and a lot of that is further built on the fact that uh, many Chinese families have been poor for 10, 20, or 30 generations, dating back to the Qing dynasty even. Uh, and, and now I think people see there is an opportunity to, through entrepreneurship, through having your, well, first through having your kids go to college, then has through entrepreneurship, then they see role models like Jack Ma, uh, who is not this, uh, you know, uh, uh, returnee top school graduate. He still made it to the top. So it really gave everybody hope that entrepreneurism is the future. You have to work hard and you have to be determined and you have to be patient but you want to get there uh, early uh, so you can be among the first to get rich. So I think a lot of this is in the current, embedded in the current culture and driving for the incredible work ethic as well as the um, strong determination and even hunger in the entrepreneurs to really make it and not only make it, but also become the best. Just a reminder, this podcast is sponsored by Spotify. I'm a massive fan of the service, and I'm delighted that Spotify has now launched a podcast hub. This means you can find all the episodes of the Exponential View podcast there, launch the app, and search Exponential View. Now, back to our conversations. I think one of the key parts of that was that was Deng Xiaoping's intervention in the in the seventies. I think any conversation about uh, China and entrepreneurship, in particular the application of technology, needs also to touch on the role of the state. Uh, in all of this. Now, you know, the US as a Silicon Valley was really founded by government funding and government research grants. Uh, But since supply side economics and Milton Friedman uh, took over, uh, and Ronald Reagan's favorite, uh, famous uh, saying, um, you know, no one wants to hear that the government's here to help. Um, American entrepreneurs seem to be very wary of uh, state interference or state involvement. Um, it's less the case in China from my understanding, but can you just characterize the role of the state in how it is fermenting and supporting the current AI-driven wave of innovation? Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, I, I think the, the government uh, often has large um, uh, efforts, which then result in substantial uh, mentality changes in the country, which is um, uh, if the right directions the right directions are picked, it can have a big impact. For example, uh, several uh, about ten years ago, China decided it would be the world's leader in high speed rails in in the usage of high speed rails, and that led to a mm-hmm. very changed transportation system. This is the J- the G trains that run from Shanghai to Beijing and other parts of the country. Yes, absolutely. It's a huge investment. It's infrastructural, and and uh, the Chinese government can be very f- good in execution when there's a big national initiative. Another one is the mass entrepreneurism and mass innovation campaign started about four years ago, and that has led to uh, about seven thousand incubators and accelerators throughout China. While not all the incubators have been successful. Uh, it has led to a change in mentality from the previously somewhat risk averse ch- mentality, especially by the parents. But now I think people view being an entrepreneur as a great thing. So these government uh, movements do work um, and in, in making massive uh, changes in mentality. So the more recent AI document came out of the state council um, in July of 2017, and in it um, described uh, China would very much like to become a leader in AI uh, uh, in research by the year 2030. And uh, that was a, uh, an important document that set the tone that AI was important, but more important than that was the actual infrastructure building that could facilitate uh, AI as an industry. To be clear, I think the AI industry is almost exclusively private capital created. 
And also all of this, most of this could happen without government uh, participation. But I do think the government participation uh, accelerates the progress somewhat. And I'll give you a couple of examples. One is infrastructure building. So um, China has a new city called Xiong'an that's going to be the size of Chicago, and it will be built for autonomous vehicle driving. It will take a few years to build a city, but once it's ready, it'll be the world's uh, certainly largest, maybe not the first, but the largest city that's 100% ready for autonomous vehicle driving, which will accelerate progress in uh, autonomous vehicles to hit the road and collect the data. There is also a province called Zhejiang, and they're upgrading their highways to include sensors and other capabilities that will facilitate autonomous driving. So these kinds of infrastructure building will show the determination of the, the government to support the technology and also make the landing of the technology easier. Uh, another areas of uh, significant um, that's significant is I think the Chinese government generally takes a what I call a techno utilitarian approach to technology, which is uh, believing that advancement of technology will actually take priority over many other issues by experiment by letting technologies launch early and then um, figuring out if they need to be regulated later. I think that is a, also a very good fit to AI in the sense that AI often works only so-so in the beginning. And as you launch the product and collect the data, gets better and better over time. So that makes it a good fit for a techno-utilitarian approach. And I think that there's, a, there's an additional layer to that, which is that um, we are, uh, certainly in, in the UK, spending a lot of time relate, uh, discussing issues that relate to privacy, security, bias, and explicability uh, in, uh, in AI, uh, almost as a, a sort of a precautionary principle before we invest in these technologies. Uh, I, and, and it doesn't seem to be that those issues are as uppermost in the minds of policymakers uh, in China from the reading that I've done on the subject. Well, um, I think the policymakers are watching the technologies and then they're very quick to implement things when they need to. To give you an example, um, the, um, there, was a, um, there were a lot of uh, loan companies um, that came out doing small payday loans, which use technology and for a very good purpose so I think the government let, let them go. But later it was discovered there were a couple of issues. Um, one is that um, uh, some companies were charging too high interest rates and that could be regulated. So they put in a threshold on the maximum interest rate that was allowed. And then the other thing was that they found a few of the companies uh, were buying data illegally from other companies uh, to, in order to, to um, either increase their customer solicitation or train their AI data. But either way, buying da private data from other companies needed to be forbidden. And essentially, that's what happened with uh, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. So the Chinese government uh, pretty quickly put together laws about sale of uh, or transfer of privacy data from one company to another, right. subject to uh, actually quite serious uh, criminal charges. So that quickly put an end to that type of privacy leakage. So I think the approach is, um, here's a new technology. We can't, we don't know everything about it and all the implications. We probably can't enumerate all the permutations of implications. So let's let it launch. If there are issues, as long as we're very quick to uh, regulate and uh, ensure that consumers are, are not further hurt by this, uh, this general approach will eventually uh, lead to a set of regulations that will protect uh, users well, but at the same time, um, given the importance of uh, pushing technology forward and, uh, and becoming a leader in technology, let's let it launch first. 
So, so I think it's not at all the government's uh, ignoring the these issues that the EU puts a lot of um, focus on, but it's kind of um, evaluating them and regulating them as they're launched one at a time. That's really interesting. This idea of proactive agile regulation, which does does sort of fit within the techno utilitarian frame that, that you described. Let's switch up specifically to the topic of of, of AI and um, and you know you talked earlier about deep learning turning up as a, a sort of a key technology uh, that is now being uh, implemented by tens of thousands of, of engineers within uh, Chinese uh, uh, companies. You're obviously a renowned expert in AI, but could you just set the scene? What is really real about AI and what its capabilities are today and over the next uh, five to 10 years? Uh, sure. I th- uh, the the deep learning and a bunch of related technologies are able to take a large amount of data in a single domain and make very accurate predictions, classification, and decisions. And uh, on the one hand, these are limited because they can't cross domain. They can't really do deep reasoning. They don't have common sense. Um, and um, they can't really do very deep planning or conceptualization. So in terms of comparing with the human, there's a large gap. But at the same time, um, most uh, of our human tasks are optimizations. That is, uh, Mm -hmm. most of what we do as humans, uh, that's not our whole job necessarily, but specific parts of our jobs can be better done by machines. So, So the AI as applied to our day-to-day process, uh, whatever our jobs are, uh, more, more, more and more of it uh, can, be, uh, can, can use deep learning and AI to improve efficiency um, and also increase profits, you know, maximize uh, benefit, minimize uh, default and errors, uh, and also reduce cost. And finally, of course, uh, displace humans who are just not going to be as good as AI in these limited routine tasks. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you talk about this in terms of, um, of job replacement, and you've been very stark about your warnings of the risk of uh, human jobs being replaced by AI systems. Uh, would you just share your your forecast, your assessment of what that, that magnitude and risk might look like? Sure. If we purely look at uh, technical feasibility, and if we break down all the jobs in the world and the components or the tasks that they do, uh, we will find that a fairly significant number will be technically doable by AI or other automation technologies in the next 15 years. So on the order of 40 to 50% of the jobs and tasks that we do will be doable technically and also economically feasible by machines. Uh, now, that doesn't translate into an unemployment number because the actual implementation of the system, the acceptance by the company and uh, labor union and governments and so on, will probably delay that somewhat. Um, but we can look at many significant jobs. So let me give some specific examples. Um, jobs that have a very... Um, limited scripts such as customer support, jobs that ha- have ver- a lot of repetition such as telesales, telemarketing, jobs that are operating in the same location repetitively such as assembly line inspection and assembly line work, uh, dishwasher, uh, and sewing. Those are jobs that machines, whether it's uh, cognitive or physical jobs, machines will be able to do. And any one of the categories I mentioned are a decent percentage of our population. And then we can extrapolate further to many other jobs uh, uh, where they'll be partially displaced. For example, uh, we probably still want a human receptionist, but the process of checking the ID and the person uh, and looking up directories uh, and querying basic questions that a machine can do. So therefore, companies that used to employ three receptionists can replace, can just employ one. 
And the same can be true with uh, uh, pools of uh, paralegal accounting assistants um, and, and uh, market sales research. While AI can't do the whole job, they can do part of the job and the pool of labor will shrink. And then there are very large chunks of jobs, for example, uh, drivers and truck drivers and other and, and commercial drivers uh, and actually the time we spend in driving, uh, once autonomous vehicle becomes um, uh, fully adopted, and that certainly that could be 20 or 25 years, but in that time frame, all the driver jobs will be gone. And that's certainly a significant percentage of the population. So if you look at the 704 jobs are published by the Department of Labor, we can probably project to half of the task with those jobs would be doable by either machines, robotics, AI, or other software technologies in um, around the 15-year time frame with unemployment starting to uh, show um, itself maybe five or 10 years later. So while humans have been able to overcome uh, technological advances that can do what people can do, uh, this is a larger percentage of our jobs in a shorter amount of time than we have ever experienced. So I feel it's something we need to uh, really uh, pay attention to. I love your analysis of this in, in the book. You have a, uh, a great two-by-two two framework where uh, on one axis you have sort of optimization versus creatable strategy type of jobs and the other axis you have social versus asocial jobs. Uh, and it's a very helpful way uh, for, to think about uh, the, the, the problem. I bring it up explicitly so listeners can go and look, look that up for themselves. And the, the scale is... Um, is really significant. And the time frame that you talk about, which is sort of 15 to 20 years, is, is short. Um, and certainly in Western countries, we've, we've never seen a transition of that speed. Um, how does that speed and scale compare to the urbanization rate uh, in China? Because, of course, China has gone from uh, a predominantly rural country to a majority uh, urban country in a very short period of time. Is, is it comparable or do you think this um, AI-driven change will be even faster? I think the level of displacement will not be that different in China from U.S. Uh, some of the analysts have assumed that because China's the world's manufacturer, the, the blue-collar jobs would be easier to replace. But actually, if you think about the AI algorithms, uh, to really fully replace a someone on the factory floor, you have to build smart mechanics and um, uh, mechanical parts and uh, robotic parts that are not yet invented or perfected. Uh, but to replace uh, someone in telesales, telemarketing, or customer support, all you need is software. So the actual white-collar routine job displacement may be faster than blue collar displacement. But I think the details have yet to, I would let leave it to the experts and academics to work out, but, but I, I would think uh, both um, the manufacturing jobs and the office jobs are over a period of 10 years or so equally liable for displacement. So I think um, China and US face similar issues. There are also a lot of white collar jobs in China. So I, I think uh, the, in looking at the proportions, uh, I think roughly the two countries would be, uh, would be comparable. Um, one, one thing that's a little different in the U.S. is uh, many of the routine jobs are paid uh, fairly high. So that creates a further incentive for entrepreneurs to, to build technologies to displace them. Uh, let's say a dishwasher in the U.S. versus a dishwasher in China. Uh, the pay may be 10x. Um, with other knowledge jobs, the pay is actually a lot closer. But, but that would leave fairly low incentive in China for someone to build a dishwashing robot. But in the U.S., uh, that might be more economic um, incentives to do that. And, and what do you see with this level of job displacement? Uh, it will may create uh, certainly individual hardship and, and sort of individual difficulty, but it may also create more widespread uh, 
unrest. Um, do you have a particular view on what the, what those sort of risks look like and how we need to uh, approach them? A lot of people talk about uh, reskilling. A lot of others talk about universal basic income, um, and others are just extremely pessimistic <laughs> about what happens. Where, where's your take on this? Uh, yes, I think reskilling is going to be a very important component of the solution. Um, but first, we have to figure out what, what, what are the areas that can absorb so many people who um, might need to look for a job. So going back to the scale we talked about, uh, it's not going to be realistic to push more people into the creative side. Because if people have worked 10, 20 years in a repetitive routine job, I think to expect them to become a, uh, a scientist is, uh, is not high. However, I think there can be a lot of service industry jobs that uh, are created because I think the, there will be uh, more free time and more wealth in the, in the world and people will want and demand and expect and enjoy great services. I also think there are segments that will have a large growing jobs. Elderly care is one of the uh, most difficult to fill jobs in the United States today, but that profession will probably increase significantly as the aging population increases. People over 80 need five times more care than uh, uh, 60 to 80. So as, as the population ages, elderly care will be a big area. And that certainly includes things like helping the elderly to um, their daily affairs, taking shower, feeding, making sure they're secure, and also talking to them and keeping them company. So those are the kinds of service jobs that there will be an increase. There will also be uh, very well-paid uh, service jobs that might include a high-end concierge, a consultant about wedding or travel, someone who comes and uh, cooks a special gourmet meal for you in your house. So I think there will be a mixture of um, a high, highly paid and high demand, large volume jobs. So I think reskilling towards this uh, human to human touch, uh, compassionate, empathy oriented types of service jobs social jobs, I think, will be key. And therefore, the policies should uh, lean towards uh, creation of these jobs, uh, subsidies for people to move into these positions, and training and, and helping entrepreneurs found more companies uh, and also existing companies to grow their employment. I'm not so much in favor of universal basic income, because as opposed to reskilling, UBI basically is a Band-Aid and it's, um, it gives everybody money, but doesn't give people encouragement to uh, reskill and improve themselves and then connect themselves to work again. I think um, the human population today really desires to work. Now we can argue over 50 or 100 years Maybe work shouldn't be as important, but it is today. And then if we have uh, 40, 50 percent of people in 30 years uh, basically become unemployed, the, lar the largest issue isn't going to be their loss of income, but their loss of meaning. So the loss, yeah, the loss of income you can make up with social welfare, UBI, but it, these things alone, purely money alone, gives people shelter and food, but does not uh, give people something to look forward to. So the jobs that have to do with social and compassion and services are actually very satisfying. If you're uh, going to an elderly home or a foster home or hospital and helping people in need, at the end of the day, um, you could get paid, but you would also feel you've really helped people. Uh, and I, th I would think there's a greater satisfaction than many of the routine jobs that people are uh, getting replaced by AI. So that's why I'm hopeful this uh, reskilling and and probably the uh, the the second one or the largest or second largest um, migration of human job in the history of uh, humanity. Uh, hopefully, we can we can do it uh, smoothly if we all share this common future. 
you, you know, one of the challenges uh, that I that I see um, in in getting to that point is that we haven't traditionally valued in in economic terms these uh, humanistic care service uh, sector jobs very well. They haven't been the focus of much venture capital investment. Um, they are not places where you know the 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 hierarchy of graduate schools um, looks to place people so in, in how do we how do we go about changing values is it policy responses um, uh, the, the changing values that say this sector is important oh, I think we had better start uh, changing the values because by the time this becomes the largest vacancy and nobody wants the job that's not going to be a good state to be in on the other hand I don't think any state can mandate and elevate the status of, uh, of an industry. So it's going to be a combination of many things. Uh, one, I think, is just vocational schools should offer more of these jobs. Secondly, for the ones that have an economic benefit, somehow there should be higher pay. Either the, the people receiving the care should pay more money, or there can be some kind of a, a governmental subsidy or taxation break or something that encourages uh, uh, in, uh, gradually higher pay. There can be government programs. Instead of UBI, we, uh, one could say if you lose your job, then, but if you are getting training to be in elderly care, or if you are spending time as community service in foster home, that will entitle you to the, uh, to the basic income payment. So it's not universal, but uh, selective. So these are some of the things that can happen in public and private sectors. Also, I think uh, impact investment. So, uh, so, so having uh, investment models that don't purely look at unicorn creation and exponential returns, but also look after job creation and social value creation, uh, that, that could also help. Uh, I, I think it's going to be a long path, but uh, just want, I think, in my book, AI Superpowers, I just want to point out, uh, let's start making uh, one step at a time because we can't just wait until um, too many of the jobs are gone and the vacant jobs mm -hmm. appear undesirable. It will be too late to make the shift then. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it, that as we look at this uh, general purpose technology of artificial intelligence, one of the messages I think that you bring out is the relative importance of humanistic values and human behavior and human to human connection uh, increases compared to where it may perhaps has been over the last 10 or 20 or, or 30 years. And uh, just as a sort of final, final question, um, thoughts from you, um, as we enter this AI world, which is also curiously a world that will potentially be more human, um, what do you think are the beliefs about success or competition or achievement today that we currently have that we will need to need to change in order to flourish in the new world? Oh, well, I think today we have been too brainwashed through the Industrial Revolution to believe that the work is the only value in our lives and the meaning of our lives. And it's, it's somewhat understandable because industrial revolution decomposed the craftsman job, like making a car, into assembly line jobs. So it's natural that the beneficiaries of the industrial revolution want people to work hard and feel that that creates value, despite the jobs potentially being routine. But as we move towards the AI world, uh, that cannot be the only value uh, be because first, uh, many of the jobs that have made people feel good that, that or falsely believe is the meaning of their lives, they're going to get replaced by AI. So they're not there anymore. So just defensively, we can't hold on to the old work-centered value. But I think thinking about this more um, positively, uh, I, I personally believe that the reason we are here on earth as humans should never have been purely about repetitively doing work, uh, but rather we as people should connect and love each other. We should uh, share our compassion, our, our genuine trust in each other. And that's what 
really uh, makes people shine and makes the world full of positive energy. So my belief is that AI is actually serendipity. In the long term, it would take away the routine jobs uh, that we currently do, and it would remind us what it really means to be human. What wonderful words to bring this fascinating conversation to an end, uh, Kai Fu Lee. Thank you very much. Uh, your new book, AI Superpowers,、uh, is out. I really enjoyed reading it, and I do recommend it to anyone listening、uh, to the podcast.、Uh, thank you so much for making the time.、Uh, thanks a lot, Azim. It's a pleasure. Well, there you have it. That was quite a mind-expanding conversation with Dr. Kai Fu Lee. I really hope you enjoyed. Listening to episode one of the new Exponential View podcast season. As a reminder, if you haven't rated or reviewed the podcast, please take a moment to do so. It really will only take you thirty seconds, a minute,、uh, and it will help other listeners find the pod.、Um, and if you haven't signed up to the newsletter Exponential View, you can do so at exponentialview. co. www. exponentialview. co. I'm Azim Azar, your host, signing off. If you want to stay in touch, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Azim. Otherwise, I'll find you here next time. Bye bye. <laughs>